My name is Era, and I'm the host of the Tamil Creator Podcast. I chat with creators from all over the world to share their stories and discuss hot topics in a way that I hope inspires, educates, and entertains you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Tamil Creator. I'm your host, Era. Today, I have a guest calling in all the way from Qatar. Her name is Mohana Rajakumar, and she is American Tamil. Uh, she calls Qatar home um, currently, but you know maybe she has future plans. We'll kind of get get into that later. Um, she is a versatile storyteller. She focuses on creating women centric content as a writer, comic, and filmmaker. So, Mohana, welcome to the show, and thanks for jumping on. Oh my gosh, thank you for having me. I just want to say how amazing it is you've been able to bring all these voices together because, like. Even before coming on the show, I listened to a few episodes and I would have never known that, you know, we're so talented and creative. There's so many different types of um, Tamil creators that you have. So well done to you. Thank you. I hope I did your intro justice. <laughs> yes, for sure. It's always weird hearing yourself being introduced, right? Especially in third person, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, like for me, I'm a recent, well, not recent now. They're like, my kids are two and a half. I have twins, but um, I absolutely love starting at the beginning just because I'm always trying to get ideas of what are these early seeds or things you could do at a young age that could potentially bear fruit for the kids as they get older. So I guess for you, the beginning is either when you're like really young or like your formative teenage years, because you have a very like interesting set of skills and life experiences and, you know, you're American, but you live in Qatar now. And I don't know if you plan to like move like elsewhere, but already you have like this you know, interesting mix. And then on top of that, you're a Tamil woman that does stand-up comic. You have a PhD in English. You're also a filmmaker. Um, I, 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 for me, I like to, I have so many different interests. So, but the advice you often hear from people is just stick to one thing or like, just focus on that. Don't dabble here and there. But I, I kind of disagree with that. I think, I mean, I think being a specialist has its benefits, but I think the future will belong to generalists. Um, so anyway, that's kind of like my like my long rant. So just really, how do you think your childhood or your formative teenage years sparked your whole interest around storytelling? Well, I think they missed it actually. So um when I was in sixth grade or so, like and I, and I have a 12 year old and a nine year old. And so one of the things I think, like I say to parents, like with you know, of younger kids, is like just let them try lots of different things. And you know, I, I have friends who are like, oh, but you know, it, she's five, and the ballet teacher told me because she didn't join last year, she's already missed the whole year. And I'm, I'm not of that mentality. Like the the ten thousand hours of practice, you know, that infamous whether it's true or not. I think that part can come later. So just get a taster of stuff. But when I was in sixth grade, the grade that my oldest is now, I wrote for my um, language arts teacher a short story for her birthday. And what's kind of crazy is I wrote her the short story and I was like, oh, happy birthday. And she's like, oh, great. Thanks. This is cute. And then it happened again in eighth grade where I wrote a whole romance novel, medieval romance novel, 250 pages, because my friend dared me to. I forget now exactly why. I should go back and ask her. And again, my language arts teacher was like, oh, I heard you wrote this novel. Can I read it? And I was like, yeah. And and I mean, I hand, you know, this is like the 80s, right? So I hand wrote it, gave it to him. And he's like, oh, yeah, that was really nice. I really enjoyed reading that. And neither of these people did any of the things that you would see in a movie, right? Like they didn't say, oh, you love writing, like do this workshop or I love the story. I rented, I entered it in a contest for you. Like none of that happened. So it wasn't actually until much later after graduate school, I moved to Qatar, um, you know, as a 20 something. And there was so much happening. Now, writing was always a passion of mine, but I thought of it as a hobby. I had the chance to do an MFA in creative writing or a PhD and the PhD um, got funding and the MFA didn't. And so I was like, okay, that's, that's a sign. I've always been very practically minded. And so you know, I wrote a short story collection. I had always dabbled in writing, but it was never my main thing. And then I moved to Qatar and I was having all of these experiences of, you know, living in a Muslim country for the first time, even though I had studied it academically, I didn't actually, um, you know, have lived experience of an Islamic society, which is why I moved here, because I wanted to kind of add that piece to my scholarship. But um, 
And the Middle East is the incredibly interesting region in terms of like um, social and racial and cultural um, kind of overlays and overlaps. And suddenly I was the first person in my family to be the closest to Chennai, which is where we're from. So my my immediate family is very unusual in that my dad went over first to Canada, actually, and then to the U.S., but the rest of his brothers and sisters were so well set up. You know, they were state engineers and this and that, that nobody else wanted to come to North America. So we were the only four that were in North America. So suddenly here I am, I'm in my 20s, I'm in Qatar, I'm closer to India than anyone else. And writing became the way for me to experience all of those things again. And it it wasn't until probably 10 years after that, that I actually called myself a writer. So I don't know what that says about me or about the role that writing has played in my life, but it took me a really long time, even though now I can look back and say, oh, but those signs were there almost from the very beginning. Why did your dad decide out of curiosity to go from Canada to the U.S.? <laughs> it's funny, we talk about, you know, every family has kind of like a lore or like a family myth. And um, I remember one one time my dad being like, you know, we kind of never should have left Canada. <laughs> and as a as a brown creator, I'm kind of jealous of my Canadian counterparts because from the outside, at least it seems like there's much more um, support and kind of convergence among BIPOC Canadian creators. I don't know if that's actually true, but that's how it feels on the outside. But my dad had grown up um watching you know all the hollywood movies and and i think america was just you know in the 70s and 80s it was just such a it just loomed so large right in the international imaginary so even though we were quite happy in canada off we went i think a lot of people underestimate the power of media or like the storytelling because you just highlighted something there which is something an answer you used to hear a lot from immigrants moving from somewhere else to like say the u.s because the U.S. is such a movie-making like behemoth, a lot of the stories are very U.S.-centric, like the ones that are popular. You know, you see all these places in the U.S. portrayed in like a certain positive way that you feel like you want to move there. And that's kind of the power of storytelling. And if you're into like other things, like I, I like, um, I think that it's more of a trend now, I guess, which is like a lot of Asian storytelling, like from whether it's Japanese stories. I mean, a lot of American stuff is ripped off from Japanese or Korean stuff anyways. But I see that stuff in like, you know, you want to kind of move to like you know, Tokyo or you want to move to like Seoul. So storytelling is just like such a, especially in the in the media, sorry, in the movie platform, it's such a powerful thing. But uh, uh, I guess for you personally, so like you, you know, your family kind of eventually went from Canada to the US, but for you, you decided to leave and go to Qatar in 2005. Like what made that, what made you decide to do that and how did that impact you? from a personal point of view and professionally as well. Yeah, I definitely think you're right in that um, U.S. pop culture is is like the best form of public diplomacy that they have. But in 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 many ways, it works against, I think, um, Americans in general, because everyone thinks like, oh, you know, all the young women are like Britney Spears or, you know, every family is like the Kardashians. Um, and definitely when I came to Qatar, there was this sense of like, you know, Westerners are godless, fearless, familyless, um, just kind of, you know, the the worst, the distilled worst type stereotypes um, from media. But for me, I grew up in a in a small Florida town, and I love Gainesville. Shout out to <laughs> Gainesville for it. Go Gators! It's our sports team. Um, but it was it was hard. Um, now I think the multicultural kids living in Gainesville now are much better off because this was the 80s and the 90s. Um, you know, diversity wasn't really a buzzword until kind of when I graduated from high school and was heading into college. So being different, being unique, there were other Indian families, um, but there weren't that many of us. And all the other Indian kids um, went to the IB program and I did not opt to the for the Ivy program. So I was in the mainstream high school. So if I had gone, if I had lived in New York or DC or LA or somewhere more cosmopolitan, I think it would have been a different experience, but I just never felt, you know, it's that whole kind of um, 
stereotypical trying to balance two sides of my identity only when I was growing up it wasn't like you could choose like you needed to be American if you wanted to survive right um so that was kind of I think that seed of kind of discomfort just stayed with me um up until I found out that the Qatar Foundation here was putting more money and resources into education than anyone else anywhere in the world and so I actually came over to help start um, a campus of Georgetown University um, uh, as an administrator. And then I met my husband at work and then I stayed and had one kid and had another kid. And then suddenly it's 18 years later. So that's how it happens. My brother-in-law, same thing, like he moved to Dubai uh, for school. And uh, I think he's been there for almost like 10, 11 years later and he's still there. So it's kind of hard to move, I guess, once you have roots in like your like formative years. I noticed something when you were speaking, you kind you know, I heard this more from I guess American Tamils than Canadian. But you call you refer to yourself as Indian versus Tamil, versus a lot of Canadian Tamils. By default, we say Tamil versus Sri Lankan. I, I'm just curious, is that something that's like um like I guess do you are you even aware of that? Or like uh is that something that you've noticed or you've heard other people say as well? Yeah, I think it it's definitely specific to context, right? So I know um Canada is a place where you can get refugee status, you know, more easily than you can, I would say, than in the United States. And so in with Sri Lanka and all the conflict and everything um that's happened there, I think, you know, you probably had to distinguish yourself, right? Like I'm I'm not Sri Lankan, I'm I'm Tom, I'm Indian and then I'm from this place. Whereas for me, I think um <laughs> I remember the first time I went to London to visit a friend in grad school, and I was absolutely flabbergasted that in the frozen section of the grocery store, they had like curry. And I was just like, I, I was like, mind blown, you know, and I could go down the, the street and get like any kind of, you know, I could get dal, I could get whatever. Um, whereas in the US, again, unless you're in one of those big cities, it's it's just one big clump. You know, I remember talking to a friend and being like, well, you know, the state that I'm from. And she's like, oh. And I said, oh. Um, and she said, well, I didn't realize India had states. And I said, well, like, what, how did you, how okay. did you think the country was organized? She's like, well, I guess I just never thought about it. So it's the, kind of like these nuances in conversation probably come up the more that you have um, an understanding. And there just wasn't, like, I remember one time one of my friends dads you know dear friends still in touch been friends for over 20 years was introducing me to someone else like super proud and was like oh yeah um and they used to call me mojo he's like mojo's from pakistan and i was like you know it's it's not that important but it is kind of important and i said oh india and he's like oh that's right and he was so annoyed with himself that he got it wrong um so i think that's the conversation that indian americans are having that's good to know um you mentioned that you went to Qatar to start, like, I guess, a branch of Georgetown University. Like, how did that opportunity come? Like, how did you get selected for that? Is that something you pitched or they were like, hey, Mohana, like, you have the experience or like, just curious how that opportunity came about? Well, of course, a limo drove to my, no, <laughs> that did not happen. Um, I was actually working at Carnegie Mellon University and. This episode is sponsored by Nobody. That's right. Nobody. So if you could be kind enough to hit that subscribe button, that would mean a lot to me. I was at a conference where I heard Carnegie Mellon had just opened a campus in 2004 in Qatar. So the six universities that are here are Carnegie Mellon, Texas A&M, Virginia Commonwealth University, Will Cornell Medical College, Georgetown, and Northwestern. And so I actually went to there. I was finishing a PhD um, in English literature from the University of Florida. And so I went to their English department. I was like, hey, I would love to go over and teach for you guys. This is like, I'm not really enjoying what I'm doing right now. Um, and, you know, it's kind of one of those divine moments, I guess. Whereas I, I still wonder about this because you hear all this again, lore, Harvard Business Review, whatever, where had I been a man, had I been a different kind of man, um, would the department head have been like, yes, of course, we're looking for you, people just like you let me fit, tell you how to do it. Well, what he said was like, oh, actually, we're not really sure how we feel about that campus right now. And we're not really 
recruiting for that campus. And I thought, oh, okay. And I said, well, I mean, either I can come and work for you in Qatar, or I'm going to end up like working at Taco Bell because I cannot, I hated my boss at the time. And he's like, well, if it comes to Taco Bell, come back to me. <laughs> so I went to a conference and I saw that Georgetown was recruiting to start their campus. So I knew about this education city is what it's called um, this education city project. And I knew I wanted to be there. So I went and I interviewed and um, they, you know, and I had been interviewing all over the country. I knew I didn't want to stay in Pittsburgh. And they said, well, we're not sure if it's a go or not. And I thought, okay, so months went by. This was April. So, okay, maybe not months, weeks, weeks went by. Felt like months when you don't know what you're doing with your life, right? And you're in your twenties. And I get this call and like, hey, you probably accepted another job. And I was like, no, no, actually I haven't. I was like, well, we're the the Qatar thing is going ahead. Do you, are you? And I was like, yes, yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> when do you need me? I'll be there. So it was a set of kind of interesting um, fortuitous circumstances. But again, I was expecting to kind of be rewarded for my pluckiness or whatever you want to call it right and I guess the universe did reward me because I ended up here but it wasn't and and what's funny is that I, I kept bumping into that same department head um and you know both campuses are still here alive and well and his daughter actually ended up coming to my house for Thanksgiving one year and so because she was here working on a project for them and it's just it's just funny the way that life kind of sends you around. That's amazing. We talked to kind of we kind of touched on like the education part of you know your experiences. And because you're a PhD, do you like to be called Dr. Mohana Rajakumar? Or like how what is that? Because I was I just yes, so <laughs> usually I usually I don't. I mean, I the way I always explain to people is like, you know, I went to grad school because I knew that I was young, I was single, I didn't have any children, and I knew if I didn't go then it was going to be much harder to go at any other point. Um, but I really went because I was a total nerd. I love studying. I love, you know, trafficking in books was like the thing that I wanted to do. But there are many moments where, you know, I'm I'm often in meetings with all men and men who are much older than me. And suddenly, like, you know, people are being conferred honorary degrees, like, you know, Dr. Ara. And it's like, well, hang on, I actually have a PhD. So in those kinds of settings, I do insist on being, you know, um, just recognized for the credential. But really, it's something that I did uh, for myself and for kind of the wealth of experience and knowledge that comes with, you know, pursuing anything like that. But it is funny when I'm hanging out with my other friends who are all doctors, right, medical doctors, and one invariably somebody will turn to you and be like wait literature can you do research in that or um wait how did you get away with that how did you how did you escape you know I'm like oh I was really bad at biology you know or chem I, chemistry you know I think uh, one of the experiences you had was you did a one woman show called being brown is my superpower and you went on tour at festivals I mean that's really I mean, I don't think I'd have the courage for sure to do that. But like, what was that experience like? Um, and like, why did you decide that that was the best way to kind of express your life life experiences, at least at that time, in this form versus say like, you know, because I know you're into like film now and like writing. Why didn't you just pick one of those mediums to convey these life experiences? I was blogging, then I became a writer, then a novelist. I was working for a publishing company. So I was in the academic space for a long time here. And then um, Bloomsbury, the folks that discovered J.K. Rowling, they came and they had a joint venture. And so um, it, what was funny about that is that a bunch of people were like, hey, you know Bloomsbury's there? You should talk to them. Because I was kind of known as the writer. And finally, the third person, I'm very suggestible. So the third person said, hey, you should go talk to them. I was like, okay, fine. I'll go talk to them. And I'm also very determined. So I tried to get the phone number to talk to the Bloomsbury people and like no one would give it to me. And so it's like, why? Why do you want to, or no, call this person. Call. So by the time I actually talked to them, I was like, oh no, I will be going to a meeting with the Bloomsbury. <laughs> you will be meeting with me. Um, and through that I was promoting a lot of other authors. 
And, you know, by the end of the day, I wouldn't have any time to do any of my own work. And so I thought, hang on, I, my stuff is this good. I, I mean, I don't know if it's better, but it's at least as good as these guys. So I wrote for a long time and the books, I learned a lot through that experience, but I kind of hit a wall. And I think this is like something, you know, for your listeners and, and for like just creative people to know is like, you can kind of be so, I don't know if good is the right word, but so dedicated to your art that you kind of squeeze all the life out of it. And that's kind of what happened to me. I, I wrote a novel a year for nine years and I sort of was looking at my books like, why aren't you doing more for me? Like, why haven't you turned into where the crawdads sing? Like, where, you know, where's my movie deal? I just thought, this is not how I want to feel about my art. Um, and, you know, there's so many different metaphors you can use for art, but if you use it in the, a familial metaphor, a healthy family, because people always assume like, oh, she's like family and that you're referring to a healthy family. But in healthy family, the parents don't expect the children to work for them, right? And so I sort of felt like, I was expecting the books, like, come on, why, why aren't you doing more for me? And I, I was kind of getting the signal, it's time, it's time to do something else. Um, and as you were saying, I thought, okay, I have these skills, what else can these skills do? And um, that's, that's kind of what led me into stand up, back into stand up, because I, I had come from a theater background, I had been a theater kid, a theater nerd, and the stand up really enlivened me. And I thought, okay, how am I going to expand this? And one of the ways to expand this is to do solo shows. So I wrote a show, solo show, which basically was a, a composite of all of the most awkward racial moments I've ever had <laughs> as like a hyphenated, you know, person. Um, and it's basically me on stage, like enacting these scenarios and then little monologues, um, stitching the vignettes together. And then the pandemic happened. So I did go to festivals, but I went to them virtually, which on one hand um, was had bonuses, but on the other hand was also terrifying because there wasn't what we're doing right now, right? So when I when I was performing, I literally was performing into like blank screen because on a Zoom show, you can't see the whole audience. Um, so it was... I was, it was supposed to be at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. I don't know if, if you've heard of it, but that's like a famous, um, the Edinburgh Fringe is where a lot of people get their start in terms of music and shows and comedy and all that kind of stuff. Um, it was supposed to be at United Solo in New York as well. Um, that also got shut down. So having it find its own life online was both rewarding and also really um I don't now remember if I was super annoyed, but it was it was not what what I had planned. Yeah, for sure. Because as a performer, you kind of rely on audience feedback to kind of see if you should tweak things on the fly versus if you have no feedback loop. It's really hard to do that. Even like, you know, for us having this conversation, we could do it without video, but then it would be like we're speaking into like a black box. So, yeah, it's definitely I think important it kind of sucks that I guess that happened that way. But I mean, um, I mean, things turned out still pretty well for you. <laughs> um, then, you know, we talked about kind of the, you know, uh, you going on tour. Then, you know, more recently, I think that's when we first connected, which was you created a, sh a short called Me Against the World, which is, you know, for those of you that are not familiar, it's an interracial collegiate rom-com uh, with a female Indian American lead. And it's uh, screened at several international festivals. And um, then you released your second film idea, which was American Baby, which I think when we connected, and this film is about the ups and downs of two newly arrived Indian expats, and it's kind of a comedy around the ordering of a beef taco. Um, I know we talked just as you're kind of doing the Kickstarter for that second movie. Um, maybe a good follow up would be, how did um, that Kickstarter go? How did your, how did American Baby get, re you know, how was it received when you kind of released it? Yeah, the films, so so kind of going from the the solo show, I was writing scripts those two years that we were all kind of stuck at home off and on. Lockdown was, was fairly strict here in Qatar. The only things that were open for five months was the pharmacy, the hospital, and the grocery store. Um, and you could only even have like a certain number of people in your car. Or the cops would write you a ticket. 
So here I am with my family. We're all stuck, stuck together. I'm like, what am I going to do? I was like, okay, let's start writing screenplays, um, which is the nub, which is sort of the some some people follow that path, right? You go from stand up to writing on a show and then writing your own stuff, whether it's for TV or for feature. And I had a screenplay I had written that I had adopt, adapted from a short story I had written like 15 years ago. I thought, let's dust this off. So I did. I sent it to the Austin Film Festival and it did really well, weirdly. I have never, by the way, replicated that success in the last three years that I had with that first script. Um, but it, it it placed in the semifinal. So it was like in the top 13% of all the scripts that were submitted that year. And you got to go to all these expert panels. And so I said, okay, what should I do next? And someone was like, get a rep. Okay, how do I do that? Well, make something. And from my novelist experience, I knew I could spend the next 10 years trying to convince someone to help me make something. Or I could go out and try to make it myself. So crowdfunding is definitely not for the faint at heart. Like you have to... Um, you know, people will say it many different ways, have no shame, be determined. You know, <laughs> I literally wrote to every single person I had ever met, including you, I think to be like, Hey, who can you introduce me to? Or can you post about this? Or, um, and you know, we got it done. Uh, it was, it was nail biting. Even like my mom, I think donated at like 1136 PM. So it was like, by no means going to be a done deal. Um, and that's one of the things I think that surprised me the most was the first campaign had like 111 people on it. And six of those people were like from our community, from the Brown community, I would say. Um, and I just found that really annoying because I was like, you guys are always complaining about how there's no representation or there's not accurate representation. And yet now here you are, here's someone actually trying to you know, help correct that. They weren't contributing uh, as you were expecting, I guess. Well, you would just think that like, I don't know, you know, there's all, all these kinds of different um, things related to that, right? Like who understands what crowdfunding is, who understands that, yes, you're counting on me, that my, I can only give $5, but my $5 matters, you know, um, all, all those kinds of things. But also like, I think there was a kind of a sense of like, you know, well, why does this fit? Why does a 12 minute film matter? And then you explain to people, well, this 12 minute film is an attempt to make a feature film and no one's going to give a first time, you know, filmmaker, even, even though I'm looking at very low indie budget, low indie budget, by the way, it's considered like 650,000. Um, then it's a, it's a stepping stone, all, all those kinds of things. But I had one friend, dear, dear friend, be like, oh, you know, I hate to talk about money, but when you make it, uh, I'll tell everyone to go and see it. And it's like, that's not how stuff gets made, you know? That's wonderful, but guess what? I, we have to get there. So were you able to actually get American Baby completed? or like? Yeah, so we we completed American Baby um, as well. And, you know, things things... One thing I've realized is like uh, the idea of sustainability or like momentum, it, it's life is not a Hollywood movie, right? So in the Hollywood version of my, or even the Bollywood, Tollywood, any kind of cinematic version of my life, I would be penning away at home. I'd make the first one. It would do amazing. Suddenly I'd get all these, you know, Oprah would be at my house being like, hey, what can I help you make? Right. And then Oprah and I would make a movie and then I'd have all the money in the world and I just keep making movies and then I just like fade off in the sunset, like writing at my home in the Hamptons as though I were Diane Keaton or something. Right. But that's not real life. So we made American Baby and now trying to get in it into some of the bigger fest film festivals like the Toronto Film Festival, um, South by Southwest, Tribeca. Um, and I was hoping to be able to film the feature this summer, but for logistical reasons, the feature is not going to be ready. So actually now we're looking at an intermediary step, which is to make this, um, to retell a Christmas Carol, um, but as a Diwali story. And instead of from Scrooge's point of view, from Bob Cratchit, if he were a woman overworked and in a toxic workplace. <laughs> So that was the uh, the project that you were talking about that you want to release. So 
why is that an intermediate like i guess because you weren't able to do the feature how will this diwali like series web series how will that be the stepping stone or help you get to that feature for american baby did you know that every time you left a five out of five review for this podcast a tamil parent lets their child pursue a career in the creative arts okay that's probably not true but if there's a chance that it is do you really want to jinx it leave a review do it for the young creative in you so it's going to be longer right so american baby so so the actual feature that we're working on um is called we against the world and it's that romantic comedy from from me against the world um and american baby is actually a discarded moment from the script where originally when i wrote the script it's if you oh. if you saw or read the namesake did you ever the Jim Lahiri novel. So that starts with the parents' story and then it switches to the kids kind of seamlessly. And that's sort of what I was trying to do. But as I was working on the script, a lot of the script coaches said, you know, this actually starts when the main character, Mala, when she gets to college. So ditch all this other stuff. So when I knew, you know, we, we hadn't hit critical mass after Me Against the World, I thought, okay, what do we need to do? We need to do this again. We need to make another short. And what is a... a a funny and I felt like festivals also me against the world rom-com it was too sweet almost for them like it was just almost saccharine so this this idea of a couple trying to order a taco holding up the lunch line being uncomfortable was both like very unique and super relatable like who hasn't walked into a restaurant and been like I don't really know you know whether it's a soup nazi or what you know just that discomfort of ordering um i thought would kind of land uh well and also show a different kind of storytelling ability um from my end and so the the web series i think is going to do that as well and at this point what we really need is kind of um that broad mass following and i think you know everyone loves diwali and everyone loves a Christmas Carol, so it could be the the perfect crossover. So, when do you plan to shoot and kind of launch this project or make it public? So, yeah, we're going to be shooting this summer in July. Hopefully, there'll be another crowdfunding campaign coming. Um, but also, you know, now I'm reaching out to brands um, and for product placement, which which I had been doing before even for the big feature but now it's like it's so niche like I'm reaching out to fashion brands and saying like hey there's a really big moment when um the main character Sita is sent like you know her Diwali Lenga from her parents would you like to be the sponsor of that of that moment even jewelers to be like hey she you know she there's a ne necklace that plays a pivotal role um in the plot would you like to would you like that to be your necklace what kind of response are you getting? Like, do they understand the the power of product placement in like a in a storytelling platform like this? I hope so. I haven't heard anything back from any of the um the products yet, but I have had like good success with people introducing me to other people, um, and just saying like even something as simple as saying like, yeah, you know, keep at it or the way I got, you know, my angel investor was, I just, I just persisted in reaching out to people um, just hearing that. Cause sometimes I kind of have a limit for myself, a daily limit of four people. I'm like, okay, I'll reach out to four people. Cause more than that, you just start to feel like you're writing into the void and less than that. I'm not sure how effective it is. So I guess uh, part of your, it's like sales. Like I'm in, I do B2B sales, like, like software sales. So you're preaching to the choir of like, you know, reaching out to a bunch of people, a lot of phone calls. You often reach out and like, you know, you don't hear back when you want to hear back, but it could be like months or years and it might not be this project, but maybe it's like a future project. People keep an eye on kind of the stuff you're doing, right? Like you've had a lot of output. You talked about that span where you did nine books in nine years, which is remarkable given it's hard for most people to even fathom the idea of one book at all right so we we kind of touched on this kind of as we were setting up to kind of have this conversation two aspects of being a creative person in the tamil community let alone kind of the general south asian community it's changing because of certain like operate like um stars that have kind of really broken out but two areas that i often get asked questions about are like finances and like kind of accessibility in the community so 
you're like you say you're a Tamil woman. Um, number one, creative arts historically was looked down upon in the Tamil community. Like your doctor, engineer, blah blah blah. Like and some mm -hmm. other like jobs, it's kind of like deemed more acceptable. But I think as a creative space is like not measurable and hard to understand, it was often looked down on. Um, how do your friends, family, and just like general social circles, how do they view kind of what you're doing and the output you've kind of generated so far? Is it, are they like supportive? Like, are they really supportive? Like, hey, you got a project, like, let me help you this, this, and this. Or it's like, well, that's cool. Like, it's like, you know, they're like, they're trying to be polite, but they're not really bought into what you're doing. Like, what kind of reception do you think you're getting? Yeah, I would say that, that most people right now are very much consumers um, of, you know, they'll, they'll come to screenings, they're happy to, you know, and, and my backers, like I create a broadcast list of email, you know, I always say like, oh, hey, we were in Barcelona or, you know, we're nominated for a festival in Stockholm. Does anybody want to come? Um, so I think for a lot of people, no matter their background, it's still a really big reach. Like, whoa, you know, there's what I'm doing. And then they're trying to connect that to say, like, you know, um, like not to not to, for example, winning best score. That's that's like a there's a big gap there. And I'm sort of like a, a public educator. Right. And like, OK, that guess guess how that happens. This is how it happens. Um, I run a short film lab for teen girls here and we had a weekend film challenge. So basically where we get people in on a Thursday and we give them 72 hours, we give them a theme, whatever support they need. We, we teach them a little bit about writing. We teach them a little bit about directing, shooting, et cetera. And then they come back on Saturday and they show us films and even getting people to sign up for that. You know, even my friend who's like a graphic designer. So somebody who is creative, who been to school to have a creative mindset to think about communication was like oh I don't know how to make a short film and I was like if you have put together an Instagram story you have made a short film you know if you've watched a TikTok you have the basic understanding of how narrative works right because you're constructing meaning um so I think that's that's the most difficult thing is trying to help people understand you already have these skills now not everyone is going to be um Christopher Nolan right but not everyone needs to be a Christopher Nolan and I was very much that way about writing as well as like not everyone is going to be um Shakespeare but even Shakespeare at his time was not considered high literature he was writing for like the masses you know um, people paid like three pennies to come and stand for three hours and that was their weekend entertainment so it, it it seems it seems hard that seems the hardest barrier to break is to connect like all these little steps into a big step but also for people them to help people themselves consider themselves as a as a creator or storyteller or make a maker of content I guess that leads to my second question which is you talked about people not wanting to do it even though they have the skills and they already kind of are doing what you what you're asking them to do um I don't know if I could be wrong but I feel like the money part of it is also a factor like I think a lot of people that are in traditional spaces that do have either the creative mindset or ability or desire don't want to get into the creative space because um you know like they don't know how they can make a, a living out of it or you know, it's like a black box and like, you know, a lot of people are not long-term thinkers. Like you said, you know, Christopher Nolan probably was like 20, 25 years in the making of like kind of developing his skills, experiences to kind of get to the point where people, like most people have watched movies before for actors. Now they watch for like the directors, but he wasn't like, you know, it's like a 25 year overnight success, which is like with most actors. Um, So that's when I, I want to kind of talk about the money part, which is, you know, how do you as a creative um, how do you manage your finances considering it's not like I guess most creatives that I know they started off with kind of a almost like a day job to kind of have that stability along with doing this but I know some that kind of just went all in what did you do and how did you think about finances to kind of plan for yourself you know I I kind of so you know when I was in my 20s um, as I mentioned I was really practical Right. And it's like, okay, I want to go. I know I want a graduate degree. My father's PhD. Um, you know, my my mom was 
they had an arranged marriage she was like 17 when they got married and they came to her and were like hey you're getting married don't worry about these high school exams right um she was the daughter of a of a well-to-do merchant and never in her wildest dreams imagined that she would be leaving India to move to multiple countries, raise, you know, all those things. So I, but in my core, I always was a creative person and I had friends that moved out to LA in their twenties and like slept on couches and, and did that. And at the time I was like, that's not for me. You know, I, maybe because of upbringing, maybe because of the culture, just who knows why but I was like I, I want the stability I want the you know I went I went I did almost all my schooling for free I lived on campus I taught so um you know I I went I didn't go to a fancy pedigree school but I'm very proud of the degree I went to a public um, land-grant institution and my PhD was free so I had I graduated I had zero debt and now I sometimes because basically the, that creative impulse never went away right? It's, it's found me now. I'm 44. Here I am making films um, from my own stuff that I wrote, you know, in my, in my late twenties, early thirties. So I guess it, it is kind of interesting to think about what if. I am really grateful though, that, um, that, that, cause the family really grounds me. So I know people who have had um, success the other way it's it's very hard for them to ever kind of actually find this piece that I found um, so that's kind of one way that I that I understand or to think about it and I think yeah you do there have to be really practical um, parts of it and of course I think about people who also you know can just call their whoever and be like hey I'm doing this startup can you give me some seed money yeah sure let me write you a check you know so I guess that happens to everyone on some level, but for sure there are definitely practical aspects of it. I definitely went the practical route. And yes, um, you know, I drove the same car for nine years, for example, when I decided to become a novelist. Um, I sort of, I went to my husband when I quit my job and I was like, I don't need, you know, fancy vacation. I could do with <laughs> first world problems, right? Like I could do with just one vacation a year. I don't need three <laughs> three vacations I don't need a new car every year um and those were sacrifices you know everyone sacrifices like according to their own kind of situation um and yeah it is it is lonely sometimes I I wrote this whole blog post years ago about like it's lonely being a rebel you you kind of have to do it because you believe in it and you wouldn't really be fulfilled um any other way but there are costs and there are there are definitely um consequences and I think you know now that there are kids involved for example this movie there's so many different ways to try to secure financing for a movie but there's many things that I will not consider because I don't think that they should should it go awry not not that it's going to but if it were to then they would the consequences would affect them you know so I do think it's a shifting landscape um, but I don't think 20 year old me would have gotten to this place at that point. Building on that, it, you kind of, uh, made a nice segue into something I like to typically ask, which is you have an opportunity to go back in a time machine and visit your 16 year old self. What would you tell her if you had a conversation with her? Oh man. So many things. One, uh, you're going to be okay. <laughs> Two, yes, you are going to get out of here um three take all the risks now like whatever risks you think you know do it and yeah I think I think those would be the three core messages and looking forward in terms of your personal legacy um in a few sentences like how would you want to be remembered by your friends and family well how what people say to me all the time is like oh my gosh you're so fearless and I'm like no no that's not I feel the fear I just do it anyway because I know the consequences of me doing not doing it are greater than me doing it whatever the rejection or the you know whatever that is is bearable my this story or this project not coming out into the world or me you know suffocating from boredom that's not bearable um so i would love to be known as someone who you know told really powerful authentic stories and also empowered other people um to to do that and to 
so cheesy, but live their best life. Money can be hard to come by, but here is a $100 opportunity for you. Join my free newsletter for free exclusive content and a free chance to win $100 when I hold special draws. Did I mention that it's free? That's a good way to segue into the last part of the podcast. It's a fun speed run I like to call Creative Confessions. So I'm going to basically say a bunch of statements and you're going to tell me the first thing that pops to mind. Ready? Okay. Uh, favorite Tamil food? Oh, Murku. Something that scares you? Um, becoming obsolete. What's an insecurity you have? Uh, that my forehead is too big. Um, favorite TV show you're watching? Oh, right now? Yes. Um, Ted Lasso, Last of Us, and The Mandalorian. Good choices. Oh, oh and The Handmaid's Tale. Season five is unbelievable. A uh, place, place you're itching to travel to? Japan. Love Japan. Uh, a fellow Tamil creator you want to give a shout out to? Um, a fellow? Well, there's so there's so many, but um, specifically, actually, I think you had her on your show, um, Sarah. Shangavid? Yes. Yes, he's awesome. Yeah, the sneaker maker, right? Oh, um, Sarah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yes, she's Is awesome. it Su- Sukumar? Yes. I, yeah. She's in. She's based in New York. Yeah, she's awesome. Um, favorite childhood memory. Favorite childhood memory. Um, maybe this is a funny one. It might be a bit weird, but my brother. You know, I have a brother who's four years younger than me, and of course, we we fought like cats and dogs for a long time until we didn't. And one day, he got really mad at me, and he like he punched me. Of course, he's four years younger than me, so I must have been twelve. He must have been like eight or whatever, and he didn't realize that I had a loose tooth. So he punched the tooth out of my mouth and it went flying. There's blood everywhere. And he was like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I just thought it was so funny because like he felt bad because he thought he made the tooth fly out. But I knew it was because my tooth was actually loose. <laughs> Does he know that now? I think so. It's probably, he's probably forgotten this or I, sh- I should send him the podcast so he could Hopefully listen. listen. <laughs> um, what's something you like to do for fun outside of work? Um, exercise, actually. Favorite movie of all time? It can be Tamil, English, or both. Oh, man. Um, for a long time, it was Last of the Mohicans. Uh, I don't know. That movie just blew me away. And then there was a movie when we were in India and like, like it would have been like 92 or 96. It was a Tamil movie. Um, and it was called Electric Dreams. And I just remember... We all love that movie. We saw it in the movie theater three times. You know, people do that. And then they always have those top of the charts film hits. And like every night it it would be, or every week it would be like in the top three. We love that movie. What's something that you could benefit from caring less about? Something I could benefit from caring less about. Rude people. What's a decision you've been putting off for a while? Um... A decision I've been putting off for a while. Hmm. I don't know. Uh, not not a long, a super long time, but deciding when summer vacation is going to start. <laughs> uh, who's somebody you'd like to have on your invisible personal council? Oh, gosh. Uh, that's a long list. But who's somebody who I think would be good um, on my invisible personal council? So there's this, um, this is really random, but I'm reading this book by um, Father Greg Boyle, who started Homeboy Ministries in LA. Um, and he's he's a Jesuit priest who works with gang members. And the book is just unbelievable. The, the work that they're doing, Homeboy and Homegirl Ministries are rehabilitating gang members um, is is amazing. So, so maybe him. Whose life do you envy? Whose life do I envy? I don't think envy is not really something I try to spend a lot of time in because I think it makes you can make you really bitter. Um, but I would I would maybe say there are definitely times uh, when I think my single friends have it a lot easier. <laughs> um, this is a question I ask because I find as we get in, become adults, we lose the spontaneity and surprise that you generally have as a kid um so is there a way that you are or feel like you could introduce more surprise into your life as an adult 
Yeah, I mean, I think people will tell you I'm a meticulous planner, um, but it's it served me well, right? I wrote those nine novels because I I outlined them, and then I wrote I did National Novel Writing Month, so I wrote sixteen hundred words a day every November um, for thirty days. So at the end, I had eighty thousand words. So I think being spontaneous, just in general, I think is. Uh, would be would be good for me to be a bit flexible now and then what's something that you've purchased in the last few years that you splurged on but you have no regret about it oh something i purchased um and i have no regrets about it i love baskets i know this is weird but but like baskets are insanely expensive like they can be like a nice basket to like hold blankets or whatever can be like a hundred dollars so the ones, whenever I see them around the house, the ones that I've actually bought, I'm like, that was a good purchase after all. That was worth a hundred dollars. Pet peeve of yours. Pet peeve. There's so many. Uh, I I just think aggressive driving is like, just get over yourself. Like we're all, where are you going? Like where, where are you going? That's that important. Agreed. My wife is an aggressive driver, but I agree with you. <laughs> if you knew that you were going to die tomorrow, I, re- I regret that you would have. I don't really have those either because I do think I have like a, I'm not saying that life is perfect or anything but I have a very deliberate considered life um there have been phases in my life like one time I was on an airplane and you know there was so much turbulence there's actually like air between you know when there's air between your seat and the butt your butt that's not good right that's like when the whole plane is sh- shaking so it was like nighttime it's inner inner um cross Atlantic flight and everyone else was asleep and this woke me up and everyone else kept sleeping but I remember thinking man if this is it I'm gonna be really mad because I have a lot to do and this <laughs> is like 10 years ago so I don't know if I'd have any regrets other than like maybe not seeing things like stages of my kids lives or or things like that but everything that I've wanted to do and that has been dependent on me to do till now I've done so what's a book you've read or a podcast you've listened to that's had an impact on you oh there's so many podcasts um like I love hidden brain I don't know if you um listen to that so that's an NPR one um with another you know Indian American person Shankar Vedantham so I love whenever he says his name this is hidden brain I'm Shankar Vedantham I'm like you go Shankar but <laughs> it looks at like different kinds of um phenomena and what what causes it so I love that one um I listen to the BBC world news global news podcast every day because I think it's a much more balanced view of international news you're not just getting um England or the U.S. or you're getting they cover Asia and Africa and and um I think it's much more well-rounded What's a belief, behavior, habit that you've adopted in the last few years that's really improved your life? Um, if it can be done today, do it. So like if you need to stay up like another hour or 30 minutes or whatever, just it's worth it just to have one less thing on your mind for the next day. And finally, a piece of advice that you'd give to your fellow aspiring Tamil creators out there. Oh, gosh. Um I would say persist, you know, um, and, you know, do whatever it takes to persist. It can be a big action. It can be a small action. And and especially if you can do one little action every day, whether it's sending that email, making that phone call, um, you know, whatever it is to move to move the needle a little bit, because at the for that day, it might not be a big deal. But, you know, like you were saying, 30 days, months, years from now, um, it will end up being a big deal. And find, find your cheerleaders. Even if you just have that one person that's like, Hey, tell me what you're up to, or, Hey, I think that's awesome. Um, that will really help you, uh, to feel less alone and, and to keep, and to keep persisting. Have you read Atomic Habits by James Clear? No, but I've heard of it. Should I? You should definitely, I mean, at least you should sign up for the newsletter um it's kind of summarizes really well kind of what we talked about which is you know as long as you're making even if it seems like microscopic steps forward to kind of move towards your goal um that's the most important thing because small small wins or small steps add up 
exponentially over a period of time. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a good read. Moana, thank you for jumping on the podcast, sharing your story, your wisdom. Um, you know, for somebody listening to this that is really inspired by your story and that wants to reach out, uh, what's the best way for them to connect? Okay, so I, you know, having set up shop here in Doha, I am Moha Doha pretty much on all the platforms. And so that's Moha underscore Doha um, on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. So yeah, just reach out. And is there anything you want to kind of give a quick shout out to any with your respect to your project or anything else that, you know, and somebody listening might be able to help with? Yeah. If you know anyone who really loves Diwali and wants to get this help, get this web series made, get in touch. Awesome. Well, thank you again. And for those of you listening, as always, appreciate it. And on to the next episode.